what I would like to do, okay, what I would like to do uh, today is to just give you a little bit more of the background as to what we really perceive is uh, the role um, of uh, uh, particle therapy in cancer care. And you have now listened already to quite a number of presentations. And frankly, I would like to just uh, limit my uh, uh, introductory slides to this historic slide, of course, uh, that uh, shows us what are the characteristics of particle therapy. But if you don't know that by now, it's a little bit too late in the seminar. Uh, now, why particle therapy and not just proton therapy, to keep it very simple, is you know we go for pro from photons to protons primarily for physics. Uh, but if we go into heavy charged particles like carbon ions or others, then we do that because we want to add the changes in the biology uh, uh, of a particle interaction with matter. And for that matter, you know, you go then in, indeed for those tumors that are very that are relatively radio resistant, are unresectable disease, unresectable gross disease, etc. Uh, and you have by now, I'm sure, have seen uh, the BRAC peak components. What is actually quite important is that yes, you have the protons with the BRAC peak in green, but you see how carbon ions have a very sharp dose fall off. Uh, they do have uh, then the disadvantage of the fragment. Tail, but overall have a very sharp those fall off. And the point is that actually it maintains its sharpness in depth carbons versus protons. Yet the yet the addition of particles to protons, meaning of carbon ions to protons, is actually also based on the difference in biology. And this is the high uh, linear energy transfer, uh, which means that in compared to protons, it can basically have. Uh, these uh, interactions with the DNA uh, that uh, in rapid succession leads to these catastrophic events of double strand breaks, et cetera, et cetera. So they basically carry a, a, a higher biologic punch than, um, than protons. And that uh, expresses itself in the fact that, for example, you know, one has very little effects of fractionation. Uh, uh, one also, uh, also has little effect in terms of the uh, oxygenation status of uh, the tumor. And uh, therefore, indeed, uh, carbon ions uh, are meant to be uh, uh, very effective, in particular for the hypoxic uh, uh, tumors. Uh, so when we say why carbon ions and other particles is because of that added increased biologic effectiveness, but we also have to recognize that we only have about, you know, in comparison to protons, only about 10 to 15, 10 to 13% of all patients uh, treated with particles are actually treated with, uh, with carbon ions, the rest primarily with protons. So we, as we have a much larger clinical ex uh, experience. And as we go to uh, these dose distributions, then you know photons versus protons, you know the entrance and exit dose that basically here really pretty much uh, adds the dose of photons to the unnecessary dose burden uh, 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 in a normal uh, tissue and actually to the unwanted side effects. And I want, and you, uh, and why is that? You know, because you basically have, like if you take a VMAT, you know, you have a number of fields, you have much less with protons, basically often four or five fields, and then you can create this dose differentials. And I just want to stay here for a minute because we talk about the contributions of particle to cancer care. If we talk about that, then one of the big advantages of particles, in particular also protons, is that we is the minimization and avoidance of unnecessary dose delivered to non-target tissues. And if we stay with this image here of the main patient treated for meningioma with 54 gray, and you see this dose differential. So this, con this means here what we did is you subtract the proton plan from the photon plan, and then you have the differential. And here you see five gray, seven, 10, 15 gray, 20, and 30 gray. And what you actually see here that the dose sparing is very significant in this plan. And it is not just the low dose plan, um, in terms of the low dose path, it is actually also goes in the area of 15, 20 gray and above, though which are those levels that are definitely of clinical relevance, certainly the younger the patient gets. 
if we look at this at another example, then these are what, then here is, for example, uh, here's the example of a, paramen, a patient with a paramenangeal rhabdomyosarcoma. You see on the panel on the right side, uh, you see this lesion in the left maxillary sinus. It basically goes up to the skull base and the uh, patient is on protocol and now has received chemotherapy, now gets evaluated. And here is now what we like to create and which we believe is very helpful for referring physicians. And this is, we create differential plans between photons and protons. So the upper panel shows you the photons, the lower shows you the protons, and you see, and then the lower right panel shows you the dose differential. You see already here how the lesion is located on the left side, yet teeth and uh, teeth, tongue, jaw of the other side get significant amounts of dosages, uh, as well as a part of the brain, actually. If you look at that in the axial images, then we can create these videos and this is an endless loop, so you can just look at that. And then it shows you, uh, again, what, that, you know, the unnecessary dose that is received to all teeth, uh, to the oral, oral mucosa. But then also in the back, actually, although this uh, tumor does not uh, involve the brain itself, you see significant radiation dose given to the brain. So these are these principles uh, of... Uh, uh, proton and uh, particle therapy upon which we really base uh, our success. And as you know, um, we and also important to keep in mind that the higher the complexity of volume gets, the more we can play out this advantage. Like this is an example that actually dates back to a patient that Francesca we have treated at the PSI actually some years ago. And uh, you can see on the Ewing sarcoma how, we, how you have to start out with a very large initial PTV1 extending literally from the diaphragm to the pelvis and then come, on, come with a boost um, uh, for residual disease. And here we are even able to spare the ipsilateral kidney, which would hardly be possible with a photon plan. So when we talk about the contributions of particles to cancer care, and then in the field of radiation therapy, it means the three dose levels are well covered. The high dose conformality. Now one can argue very well that many of the uh, modern uh, um, photon techniques, albeit for example, you know, VMAT or SBRT, et cetera, can achieve a similar high dose conformality. Uh, what what remains, I think, with this, the strength of um, uh, particles and particular protons is the avoidance of the low dose uh, bath. I'm sorry, misspelled this, the low dose bath. But what is also often forgotten is the clin a clinically significant reduction of the moderate dose level volume. So if you treat to 60 gray, you can wrap this around in a very conformal way, you can avoid the low dose path, but you can also significantly, in the majority of patients, reduce actually the moderate dose levels that are also in the adult patients clearly of significance. Um, now, once we move to heavy charged particles, then of course we talk about the high linear energy transfer, but I also will explain later the immunogenic potential of it. So, Let's talk about the components that at least I see here and uh, of the contributions to cancer care. We obviously, obviously the issue is of tumor control, cure, and survival. Unless we increase cure, unless we increase survival, there is really little benefit. Uh, the avoidance or the uh, uh, clear reduction of acute and chronic lifelong side effects. Uh, that with it goes the quality of life. Remember that the definition of cure is to restore the patient to the state that he or she had before the disease started. That means not to get rid of the disease, but to restore the quality of life that the patient had. Then the issue is, can we reduce the uh, induction of second malignant neoplasm, meaning the risk that a second cancer arises maybe decades later in life, uh, in, uh, um, induced and uh, by the initial radiation. Uh, 
the question of interdisciplinary management. I will not talk about this specifically later, but let me just tell you that, of course, when we combine um, uh, 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 radiation therapy with various systemic therapies, albeit the classic uh, chemotherapy or immunotherapy or other systemic therapies, then often by being able to deliver less radiation to normal tissues and have lesser acute side effects, the, our colleagues in medical oncology in terms of the concurrent treatment management can actually either intensify or carry through with the intended chemotherapy. In contrast, and in the older days, it was not unusual that when you combine radiation and chemotherapy, that the chemotherapy had to back off because it was just getting too toxic. The, uh, another issue I want to manage, the contributions to cancer care, is the re-irradiation for local failure after primary radiation therapy. And then I want to talk about a couple of more of the more modern issues, right? And this is the immunogenic, immunogenic response induction, I want to at least mention FLASH and talk about particle therapy in general. So when we talk about the lifelong side effects, then we are basically talking first and foremost about proton therapy for pediatric neoplasms. And here we know back on of, of this landmark article in 2006 a while ago already, but nevertheless, uh, it's still uh, very valid as of today. And this is from the Child of Cancer Survivor Study when they looked at the outcome of, of, of uh, you know, the status of adults who have survived pediatric cancer, and then you had more than 60%, at least one chronic condition as a result of treatment, a quarter severe or life-threatening conditions. And if you, when you look at this, and this is plotted against time, and actually down there, the axis is actually years. So they have data on 10, 20, 25, after radiation, um, then you actually see that this is the gift that keeps on giving. It just doesn't stop in various organs. Now, we have now the fortune of having uh, the uh, Pediatric Proton Consortium Registry, uh, which is basically a pool created uh, by the people at Mass General Hospital, where people voluntarily of various proton centers submit their, submit their data, and there are a number of publications out coming out of that, from which we gain a lot of uh, knowledge in the years now to come. Just briefly, uh, you know, since it's uh, at least a third of all patients, of all pediatric patients are treated for brain cancer, uh, brain tumors, the issue of course, being, well, how does protons fare? There is one publication for uh, recently from Northwestern University on 125 patients that were basically matched protons versus uh, conventional radiation therapy. And there was a, a, a significant improvement for the proton patients with regards to full-scale IQ and processing speed. Another study is it was a phase two single arm study um, from a Mass General Hospital found 59 patients uh, that were treated for pediatric metalloblastoma. Also here, what's important, of course, first of all, you have equivalent local control. But then again, only a minor IQ decline, minor neuroendocrine deficits, despite actually quite aggressive treatment of craniospinal axis and boost. Sorry. Okay, Francisco. And then, uh, and then, it's okay. Yeah, sorry. We, there are some issues sometimes with the microphone. I, okay. Uh, I, I can maybe talk louder. Is that better? Yes. Probably, yes. All Perfect. right. Good. Thanks a uh, lot. Sir. Okay. All right, well, and as we move on, uh, uh, then again, there are mounting data from the proton pediatric community that we have a superior intellectual outcome after protons compared with photons. Now, what is interesting is that most people uh, actually agree about that importance in the pediatric patients, but there's quite some discussion ongoing uh, if uh, uh, it's necessary to use proton in the adult patient population. And actually here we have a, a, um, a study here at Med Austron ongoing, where we, you know, we, the, we have that registry study open since 2017, uh, and it has accrued now 800 patients. And in the patients treated for CNS tumors, which are about 200, we did neurocognitive assessment. 
And we prospectively obviously looked at these patients. So they did the battery test of five you know, tests. So these are the neurocognitive tests as they are used by Estro. And they did that repeatedly. And basically now at two years for this group of 128 patients with either intracranial or skull-based tumors, we did not uh, see any loss of neurocognition in the vast majority of those patients. I, I would like to just go to another quick uh, uh, matter and then I leave the area of, uh, of uh, um, uh, chronic side effects. And this is the, the heart matters. And this is a, a, an issue now that is not just with for breast cancer, but also for the thoracic tumors in general. You know the landmark, there is a landmark study uh, on the risk of ischemic heart disease in women after radiotherapy for breast cancer that assessed that the mean dose of radiation to the heart correlated directly with the increasing rate of major coronary events and for that matter, heart attack. And as you can see, um, as we have shown then in various studies is that protons even actually in very um, advanced situations can typically keep the mean heart dose to about two or so gray versus you quite frequently actually have IMRT plans and various institutions that might exceed 10, 12 or more gray, clearly than being on the uh, upper end there of the, of the scale. And here you see a typical proton plan for breast cancer. You see a, a, a significant reduction of any heart dose, although maybe a coronary like the LAD or a branch of that might still receive some dose. And uh, there is now a big PCORI trial ongoing in the US to actually evaluate that, uh, that situation long-term. Um, I would like to go to the induction of second malignant neoplasm uh, because that's of course a, a, a issue that is extremely important. And we always, so for many years now have made this also a centerpiece of the, indi of the indication to treat with protons. So there are various theoretical, theoretical models, last but not least, also done by some of the speakers uh, at this panel at the seminar, that suggests a decreased risk using protons compared to protons. But we only have really very limited data, in particular from the longest operating centers that would have the long-term data because these patients were actually primarily not on prospective registry trial. Uh, but we do have a very interesting finding that I want to share with you. And this had been presented at ASCO uh, from Stanford University. They went to the National Cancer Database, which captures about 70% of, uh, of all cancers in the US. They looked at overall at 450,000 patients. I mean, just a staggering number. Granted, the vast majority treated with IMRT and 3D CRT, but at least there were almost 6,000 proton patients in it. And you see the different disease sites. And that gets us actually very, very, very quickly to an interesting point because many of those were prostate cancer patients. Uh, and I'll come to that in a minute. And basically, they were show, showing that the absolute crude incidence of second cancer was significantly lower with protons compared to photons. And it was a significantly so between IMRT, uh, with protons and IMRT, but uh, similar between IMRT and 3D CRT. What was interesting is that it was seen across all ages. Now, they had few pediatric patients. So although, of course, that's the most vulnerable population, that's the data we actually really would like to have. On the other hand, we have those from other publications. But what is interesting that this actually, uh, that uh, proton um, therapy was favored throughout the ages. And this is just something I think that in particular for the group of listeners here, that is very important. And uh, this is the, uh, the following that the reduction of risk of second malignant neoplasm is not only relevant for pediatric and young adult patients, but it is relevant for patients well into mature adulthood. So if you just think about it, I mean, if so, somebody is 40 or 50 years old, and if you think that most of the second malignancies will show up maybe between 3, 10, and 20 years afterwards, well, then that those patients live long enough to uh, experience it. So that discussion about the risk of second malignancy has to, as for us radiation oncologists, has to happen well with patients well into the mature adulthood. 
and I'm sorry, let me just go one more back, because actually the conclusion of this uh, publication was that the protons can significantly reduce second cancers compared to IMRT by about 50 to 70 percent. And this here shows you an actual example of one of the patients that uh, I've treated here, a young um, a teenager, a 14-year-old with Hodgkin's disease. The idea is that here the mediastinum needs to be treated, um, uh, where the, the origin of the Hodgkin's disease and some residual tumor still was, but we wanted to avoid the breast tissue in order to avoid a significantly increased risk of breast cancer later in life. And you see very nicely how coming in from a posterior approach, you can actually successfully do this. Um, when we, again, going back to um, the topic that I have been given to talk about, and this is the contribution to cancer care, but what are the other big topics? So we talk about second malignancy. We talk about the fact patients should uh, survive their cancer with the least amount of long -term side effects and therefore maximizing quality of life. There is another very big topic, and, um, and this is the re-irradiation for local failure after primary treatment. What we are talking about here is really that patients um, have failed treatment, and, uh, and, if, and this may be also with protons. It can be, of course, I mean, we are not immune from this. But if you look at it across the board, you will see that probably about 30% of all patients undergoing conventional radiotherapy will fail their local treatment. That's sort of a standard number one can find. And this, by the way, is the first patient we treated here at MedAustron for a you know, recurrent disease uh, in, the, in the larynx region. And, she, uh, and this actually also exemplifies the problem. The problem is that very often these patients, um, in these patients, they have no surgical option, either because of the location of the tumor or like in this case, because the patient had so many comorbidities that she was such a high surgical risk that she simply could not be operated on. And then you have the issue, well, is there any systemic therapy out there? Well, maybe yes, but very often not. So these patients are starting to stand against the wall. And here's the question, you know, what can we do to contribute? Can we contribute to that cancer care? And the answer is maybe yes, maybe no. Uh, and the reason why I'm saying this is because uh, this is a highly individualized uh, decision. Re-irradiation, even with protons, is nothing for the faint-hearted. It is a truly a challenging situation. And you really have to evaluate each patient and understand, is this patient a candidate for your treatment or not? The question, there are several criteria that you need to have. Uh, the, for example, the time of failure, Typically, if a failure is within the first year, it probably indicates that there was never any control in the first case. Most data indicate that also the second time around, you might not really be successful. Other things like, is this an infield versus margin failure? Do you have any residual OAR tolerance left of the critical organs? Or are you simply out of luck and the tumor is right next to the spinal cord. The spinal cord has already received two years ago, 50 gray, well, then you may as well just forget it. Uh, and of course, other issues, in particular, actually the general life expectancy of the patient, but it can be done. It can successfully be done. You just need to select your patients. Uh, here's one patient. I just skip, tell you what, I skip over this because otherwise it might be running out of time, but just to, just to tell you, here, a 36-year-old female with cervix cancer. She had the usual state-of-the-art treatment, which was basically radiochemotherapy with VMAT and brachytherapy. Here you see the VMAT plan, then you have the brachytherapy plan. So all that was perfectly fine standard of care, and yet, boom, she has a recurrence. And you see it here on the left, uh, for example, pelvic sidewall. If you now do a photon versus a proton plan, like we have taken a look before, you see here on the dose differential, a quite significant sparing of rectum, uh, of bowel anteriorly, rectum posteriorly um, by use of uh, protons. So this is what we do. So the fact actually is, and this is just, uh, is that the minute you open a particle center, you will be faced with re, with re very frequently. If we looked at our first 1,200 patients,
communications created at Van Alstron, then you see here, you know, our major components were CNS, head and neck, pediatrics, but number four at 14% right out the gates were uh, re irradiation. Um, we have looked again at our registry trial with those 800 patients that we have in there right now. We looked at the re-irradiation of adult CNS tumors. Uh, these were around 50 and we have local control at two years of 87% with actually a very acceptable toxicity of less than 10% for grade, uh, higher than grade two, which is a very acceptable number considering that, you know, you talk about high doses accumulatively. <clears throat> I'm sorry. And then we also looked specifically at re irradiation of pediatric CNS tumors there in our first 15 patients. We have um, 50, we have 100% local control and no higher high grade toxicities. We're obviously observing that uh, quite carefully. And when you do this, then you just, and I, I give you these slides and then you can look at them for yourself later. Uh, you know, you have to have a very clear algorithm as to how do you want to deal with re irradiation. You cannot do this just on an individual basis. You also need to really have a roadmap and an algorithm how you want to proceed. Um, now, there are a, a couple of uh, other issues that I would at least like to touch on. What are, when, again, when we are talking about unique contributions to cancer care? And this is an emerging issue that I find quite fascinating. Um, and I have the good fortune of having Dr. Tubin here, who has been one of the people who have actually very much promoted this <clears throat> already well before he joined us here at MedAustron. And here's the issue of carbon ions to stimulate immune response. You know, you all know if you have dying cancer cells, that they will send immune stimulatory signals and ultimately obviously that induces the lymphocytes, et cetera, the immune response. Uh, we also have shown that there are specific advantages of particle therapy, in particular the group around Marco Durante um, has worked uh, very heavily there. Um, you have, for example, the median values of lymphocyte count surviving in esophageal cancer patients who so you leave actually lymphocytes intact um, as well as the fraction and decrease the fraction of aberrant uh, lymphocytes with carbon ions compared to uh, x-rays. We also uh, have a um, increase in surrogate markers of immunogenic cell death with carbon ions. To combine this, uh, we now here under the guidance of uh, uh, Tubin have actually a, a, a particle-based partial tumor radiation of the toxic segment pilot study that is IRB approved. And we are basically talking about patients with really horrible, unresectable, bulky tumors of various histologies. What we do also in, in terms of having um, uh, permitting patients with metastatic disease where in a SBRT kind of fashion, hypofractionated 12 gray <clears throat> or up to 15 gray times three, we target only the hypoxic center, leave actually the periphery of the tumor and the uh, immediate uh, uh, environment, uh, biologic environment of the tumor intact in order to allow a maximum potential tumor response. Uh, or immunogenic response actually of the body that is triggered by the destruction of the inner core of the hypoxic cells. So it's a very, it's very interesting and very innovative. And we're looking forward to sharing uh, those results, hopefully very soon. There is of course also the issue of flash. And there was just now in the last week was a very interesting conference here in Vienna. And I have borrowed some slides here because we at MedAustron presently do not go down that route just simply because of lack of, of resources right now. But as you probably have heard already that flash is the ultra high dose rate radiation, several orders of magnitude higher than what's currently used in conventional clinical radiotherapy. You saw about 40 to 120 gray per second versus you know, the traditional maybe five gray per minute. Uh, and the issue is here that it reduces the normal tissue toxicities while still maintaining the local control with these underlying, uh, 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 with these high doses 
delivered. The underlying mechanisms are actually not fully understood, but it's a very active uh, um, area of uh, research currently ongoing. Um, and uh, uh, the, here it shows us it may have the potential to, to reduce radiation induced chronic inflammation. Um, uh, the indirect DNA damage is thought by a radiolysis of water and generation of reactive oxygen species. Suffice to say, it's a highly attractive area of a research. And it does have now it's a clinical trial uh, actually ongoing in Cincinnati uh, with 10 subjects with one to three paper bone metastasis, eight gray and single fraction, and literally more than a uh, dose rate of more than 40 gray per, per second. So let's see where this area of research will go. But also here, protons are actually uh, believed to be very advantageous. Now, it's time to now spend a couple of minutes, of course, on other particles. And <clears throat> by that, I mean primarily actually carbon ions, although others as well. So we go back to the initial slide, and this is what do carbon ions or other particles add to the mix, and this is the biology we talked about already. Now, if we look at the patient mix that we have at Medaustron, where we have both protons and carbon ions, carbon ions since July, 19, right out of the gate, again, re-irradiation, but then head and neck tumors, sarcomas, even prostate cancer. When you look at the selection algorithm and you have some established indications, those are the sarcomas, gross disease, either undersectable, residual, or recurrent, adenoid cystic carcinomas, malignant mucosal melanomas, and an analogy to re-irradiation, uh, the re-irradiation uh, concepts, I'm sorry. Um, so I would like to share with you one of these patients that I treated uh, now more than a year ago, a year and a half ago. This was a young man, which this gigantic sacral chordoma. These are the images of this chordoma. And this patient was doing exceedingly poorly. It's an avid outdoors man, um, you know, skiing in the winter, paragliding in the summer and all that. And uh, he was just miserable in excruciating pain. He could only walk basically on a walker, had no urinary control. Sex life was gone for a 30 year old outdoors man, but it was pretty bad for him. Uh, obviously this to say would be for anybody. Uh, so we treated him in a typical highly fractionated way uh, uh, as it has been established by the colleagues in Japan. And that is to give him 16 fractions of 4.6 gray applying the uh, RT uh, model to 73.6 gray. And, and what was really very interesting and telling that at six and 12 months, he had complete resolution of his urinary incontinence. Uh, he had basically no pain and he was suddenly sexually active. And if you looked at the radiographic response at six months, he had already a 33% shrinkage and 12 months he had a 50% volume reduction. These are pictures that we have seen again from a single institution. I personally had really not witnessed that and certainly not with, not even with protons high dose. Uh, and we shall see uh, right now. And this, if we talk about actually about cancer, the contribution of cancer, of particle therapy to cancer care, then this is a perfect example. Uh, because there is currently ongoing that SACRO trial in Europe, which is recruiting wonderfully at a wonderful speed, where we are actually say, comparing surgery with, with particle therapy. So patients either have the surgery or they do not have surgery, but have particles. And right now, this trial looks, there's no difference between the outcome of the surgery versus the outcome of the particles. And if anything, particles actually had a negative selection bias. And uh, this, if we talk about the contribution to cancer care, it may very well be for, that for certain indications, we will be able to offer an alternative to surgery and patients just go to particles. And as we are talking about now, um, about the different particles, uh, then, then there's the issue, well, can you combine them? 
And indeed, if you look at it, this is what we are currently already doing here at our center. And this is the first three ones, three examples. And this is, you know, if you have a carbon, uh, I, you use carbon ions for a radio resistant tumor, then you can do carbon ions only. But you have a tumor that has been part resected, so you need a clinical target volume. Yeah, you can still use carbon ions. If you, however, have a small residual tumor and a big post-operative bed, there's really no um, proven advantage of using carbon ions uh, to, if you will, clean up microscopic disease, meaning you apply it in the majority to normal tissues. So what we are doing here already is that in these patients, we start out with protons for the CTD and then use the carbon boost for a GT. Now in the future, what we want to do, but there the treatment planning system doesn't allow it yet. And we have active projects that hope will hopefully allow that in the very near future is that you integrate. It. So you use protons for the CTD, but in the same session, you use carbons for your GTD. That would be obviously the maximum benefit. So now I, I did, I mean, you know, I was told, you know, with 45 minutes and that has to include the questions. So I believe I, I tried to give you a little bit of a tour de force here uh, through the areas I believe are really of interest. Um, I left specifically also some of the tumor control data out and the clinical data, assuming that they were actually given by the previous speakers. And I thought I, I focused today more on where I do believe that a lasting value of uh, and a unique value of uh, particle therapy will be for now and in the future. So I thank you very much for your attention and I'm open for questions. Thank you, 